Good morning. My name is Jacinta Kapogu, and I serve as Senior Gender and Youth Specialist at Youth Power Learning. Today's webinar is entitled um, Relieving Bottlenecks in Adolescent Girl Programming, Community Engagement and Mentor Quality. And it's hosted by the Population Council. So Youth Power Learning is a um, USA project um, which is focused on generating and disseminating knowledge about the implementation and impact of positive youth development um, approaches in international development. So what is PYD? PYD is both a philosophy and an approach focused on building youth assets and leveraging those assets so youth have the ability to contribute to positive change for themselves and their communities while being supported by their enabling environments. As Youth Power Learning, we seek to have partners within the youth development community. So how can we partner together? Well, we can connect at various youth power activities that are, are hosted throughout the year. We also have a learning hub at youthpower.org where we share resources, information on events, and we also have a what works on what, uh, what, what works in positive youth development in various sectors. There's always opportunities to also contribute to the PYD learning agenda, which was launched last year, which is really focused on advancing the evidence base on um, positive youth development across areas related to PYD measurement, vulnerable and marginalized po populations, understanding how to design cross-sectoral programming, uh, youth engagement, and also understanding um, the mechanisms of PYD. And so we welcome various organizations to contribute to this learning agenda, um, looking at, at our learning agenda themes and seeing how we can collate and summarize the information of what we're learning from PYD. There's also opportunities to engage with Youth Lead, which is our platform for youth change makers under 35. And we, we, we encourage um, youth leaders to join this platform and connect with other youth um, in this area. And lastly, we encourage everyone to please sign up for our communities of practice. We have four communities of practice focused on youth in peace and security, gender and positive youth development, youth engagement, and cross-sectoral skills for youth. So today, um, I'm going to hand it off to Miriam Temin who's going to introduce the speakers and talk about the launch of some materials on community engagement. And this webinar is really focused on how do we reach out to vulnerable marginalized uh, populations and what resources um, are available to help support programming for those target populations. Miriam? Great, thanks very much, Tasina, and good morning, good afternoon, and possibly good evening to some of you. We're so pleased that you are able to join us for this 90 minutes on uh, our new program resources. Briefly, to introduce the four speakers, I'm Miriam Temin. I work with the Population Council in New York, and I lead our efforts to translate evidence on uh, particularly adolescent girl programming into policy and practice with a heavy emphasis on capacity strengthening of implementers, following a long career that's traversed through UN agencies, DFID, and others. I will be followed by Dr. Sajda Amin, who leads the council's work on livelihoods for adolescent girls. She's a senior sociologist and demographer. She has edited, authored, or co-authored more than 80 research papers and is currently leading a component of a multi-country child marriage prevention project. Following Sajida, we will hear from Ava Roca, who is a consultant with the POP Council, has worked with large agencies like ICRW and UNICEF, as well as the Council, has research interests including migration, Native and Indigenous girls, and is currently obtaining a PhD in public health. And finally, we will hear from Angel de Valle, who is the acting country representative of our POP Council office in Guatemala and a senior research officer. He's been working since 2010 on the Abriendo Oportunidades program, which you'll be hearing about later. And he has led evaluations of girl-centered programs in Guatemala, Honduras, Belize, El Salvador, and Mexico, so deep uh, regional knowledge. 
and we uh, look forward to hearing from all of them. Turning now to the webinar, I want to give you a quick overview of the agenda. The overall goal of this webinar is to introduce two new program resources. But in addition, we'd like to share with you where they came from, how to access them, and how the tools and ideas that they encapsulate uh, are used in real-world programs. So first, I'll give a brief introduction uh, to the journey that got us here, and then I will introduce our first tool, the Community Considerations Guide. I will then turn over to Sajida, who will give us a case study on Balaka Child Marriage Prevention Program in Bangladesh. Then she will pass it to Ava Roca, who will introduce our second tool, which is a mentor toolkit. And then Ava will turn to Ankel uh, to uh, share another case study from a different region from Guatemala on uh, how the mentor tools have been used in that context. And we will wrap up then with a uh, brief uh, discussion of the links with the PYD learning agenda and move into questions and answers. First, I'd like to share with you how it is that we got here to talk about implementation lessons, why we are talking not about evaluations, uh, results in terms of impact, but implementation uh, lessons that have emerged from the operationalization of programs. Here at the Council, for 20 odd years, we have been testing a theory of change which posits that if girls meet in community-based groups with mentors to build assets that are uh, multi-sectoral in nature, assets might be life skills, they might be financial literacy, they might be friends and role models, by building these assets, uh, we can empower girls with voice, choice, and control. And we are continuing to test to determine if this leads to measurable benefits on uh, the outcomes that we care deeply about related to child marriage, health, HIV, schooling, et cetera. Now, our uh, theory of change is very much adapting a socio-ecological approach. So as you can see from the graphic on the slide there, uh, that describes uh, the fact that individuals are not uh, living in bubbles, but in fact that they live within families, they live within communities uh, that are embedded within countries, and that, that uh, those Social influences have a tremendous impact on individuals, girls in this case. They also have an important impact on the program, and we'll come back to that point later. So through these efforts uh, of the council and many, many others, including hopefully many of you on the line today, we are learning more about what works for adolescent girls as well as what doesn't work for adolescent girls. Now, as the body of impact evaluations expands, we see a lot of mixed results. Sometimes programs will have an impact for one type of girl and not for another girl, or perhaps more uh, importantly, a program that worked in one setting will not work in a different setting or in a different country. Uh, why? Some of this has to do with how and why the programs were implemented. So, for example, variability in things like community acceptance, in things like participation rates, the duration of the program, the dosage, the saturation amongst the target population all have an influence on it, these uh, mixed evaluation results that we are seeing. However, there has been less study and less documentation of the operational aspects of programming. Often it's the institutional knowledge that is in a uh, program director or principal investigator's head rather than um, being written down and documented. There are some now increasing efforts to try to understand what are the factors that influence a program and either threaten or enable the likelihood that a program is going to have the desired effect. So we here at the council have been doing some work to identify, begin to identify what are those important uh, influential factors, and we are going to be diving into two of these today that have seem to be uh, very influential across many different settings. Firstly, the community level influential factors that when we talk about community, we are referring to both the social community, the social environment, as well as the physical environment, the geographic environment. The second influential factor that we'll be talking about is mentor performance. I mentioned our theory of change earlier and the critical 
role that mentors play at the intersection between the program staff and really the aspirations of the donors and the beneficiaries themselves and uh, the important uh, function that they play and how important it is that they are doing a quality job. So through trial and error, through some research, uh, we are increasingly identifying tactics, uh, testing and identifying tactics uh, that will promote the enabling influential factors and mitigate the threats to them. So now I'm going to turn to the practical implications of all of this. So here at the Council, we have a collection of practical program resources, tools, other types of resources, sample curricula that are available online, and we'll share a link later. And uh, these are based on evidence and experience, and they are global public goods. So uh, they are available to all of you. We work with implementers to support their use and strengthen capacity uh, around operationalizing the contents, and we are deeply committed to promoting research impact or research utilization. So we're very excited about these two new tools that are joining our existing collection. I'm going to spend just a very few minutes introducing uh, the Community Considerations Guide, which is uh, the first of the tools. So, of course, we know that differences between communities have implications for the program, both in terms of the design, so that might relate to the size of the groups, the location of the program, the timing, as well as the content, what uh, a program consists of. And in this way, given the importance of these community level factors, we like to think of the community as a participant in the program. So of course the program staff, the mentors, the girls are participants, but considering the community a participant and treating the community can be a useful way to give due attention to the influence of community level factors. Now, of course, no single approach to program design and community engagement is going to work everywhere. We adopt an approach that we uh, term intentional design, which is uh, based on the notion that collecting and utilizing information to inform program design and delivery and course correction can help to reduce threats and promote enablers. So taking an intentional approach to uh, embedding the program within the community can be very helpful. And we have pulled together questions that our, uh, our expert colleagues have considered to be very important into this community considerations guide. This is what it looks like, more than a backdrop, understanding the role of communities in programming for adolescent girls. It is a guide, it's not a set of answers, it is a set of five questions, and it's short, it's only six pages, so very accessible, we hope. And within these six pages, you'll find the five questions that we have identified as important to answer when establishing community-based girl groups. We hope that they are also useful for other types of community-based work, not unique to uh, safe space programs by any means. Uh, and that the questions are described. We also make some suggestions of how one might go about answering these questions and then provide a brief case study. And at the end of the presentation, uh, there's a slide with a link to this tool. So we encourage you to download it, read it, and uh, hopefully uh, think about how answers to these questions can help to inform program design that will take account of the community as a participant in the program. Very briefly, I'm going to flash up the five questions and talk about a few of them. Uh, given time, I'm not going to talk through all of them. So for example, first, how many girls live in your program community? What is the nature of the community? And this is helpful in thinking about the treating a whole community that surrounds the girls. How Large is the community, how densely or sparsely populated, for example, how many girl groups do you need to establish to get the right number of girls in a group? Being intentional about defining the bounds of the community 
that makes sense from the girl's perspective uh, can be very helpful in optimizing access to the program. You can see another question, uh, the nature of the community in terms of urban, peri-urban, or rural, formal, or informal. And finally, uh, how stable or cohesive is the community? And who is considered a community member? So the nature of a community in terms of its safety, security, greatly influences the degree of risk adolescent girls face, not only in terms of crime and gender-based violence, but other types of risks as well, participation in public life. Very closely related to this, is it a very transient population, for example, where refugees settle, um, or uh, other types of migrants, domestic workers, girls in some parts of the world frequently move to uh, serve as child domestic workers. Are refugees and domestic workers considered community members? This is an important consideration in terms of the group, in terms of how acceptable the program is going to be in the community. What resources exist for girls and who actually has access to them? And finally, then the community, it's not just about the characteristics described earlier and the physical features of the community, but also the normative environment, which I has an enormous influence on your program. So preferences, for example, about how boys and girls are supposed to be spending their time, important, and uh, that can be as big a barrier, for example, as a lengthy ride or unsafe transport options. So I encourage you to um, go online and uh, download the guide and let us know what you think and um, come back with questions. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Sajida Amin, who's going to talk to us about how the Balaka program engaged communities and address some of these factors. Over to you, Sajida. Thank you, Miriam. Um, it's a pleasure to participate in the second round of um, conversations with uh, PYD um, talking about Balika. So just very briefly on what Balika is, it was um, it, in the phase that I'm talking about, it was uh, an RCT designed to test whether uh, what type of skills and whether skills development for adolescent girls worked to uh, affect child marriage. Um, this was back, a start, the project started back in 2012 when the hoopla around child marriage had not yet begun. You know, sort of which I think the global movement around child marriage, I would say, got its impetus in 2014, I believe, with the Girl Summit. So in Bangladesh, people were all just starting to become aware that Bangladesh was um, the, had the highest rates of child marriage in Asia and was fourth highest in the world. Um, and there was some level of awareness nationally, but it didn't trickle down to local levels. So. This is an important background uh, fact that I think you need to keep in mind in, as I talk through what our community engagement strategies were. Um, a second background um, information, sort of um, hindsight, um, uh, is that um, we, uh, uh, we saw that our approach for Balika worked to reduce child marriage rates by about a third uh, in some instances or by at least 25% in others. Um, and we tested three different types of skills and uh, did not see much difference. All three types of skills had similar impact. But that's not what I'm talking about in this presentation. I'm talking here about um, what um, different types of community engagement we tried and uh, my opinion on what was important. And then I'll finish by saying what we are doing now uh, in terms of asking more questions about engagement strategies. Um, so uh, Balika was a girl-focused, community-based, village-based skill development program. And the idea behind Balika was to treat, like Miriam was saying, treat both the community um, with the idea that girls are, can be empowered and they can be so that they're status and their uh, position in the community changes. So uh, keeping girls at the center and 
changing the community environment was the objective. Uh, so first slide. So what are um, the different types of engagements we did? Uh, we did, we ended up in Balika, as we do with many other programs, in doing a lot that was beyond the girl, even while trying to keep a focus on the girl. And so one, at one level, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, participated in a lot of community-wide activities involving both community leaders, people in power um, in charge of making decisions, as well as parents who were part of that, the, the household bubble uh, that Miriam talked about. Uh, uh, and also keeping in mind that um, girls always had to be present. So uh, this is one type of activity which sort of diffused across these categories. Um, and uh, But again, sort of kept it girl focused by keeping the activities at the center, for instance. We had m made a deliberate decision to uh, run the program in the village itself. And we had to think quite deeply, it, uh, again, along the ways that um, Miriam was talking about, about what that community looked like that we were treating. Um, a lot of it was uh, by way of considering measurement issues because we were assessing impact at the, not at the participant level, but at the, um, at the community level, that a lot of it was trying to understand, uh, you know, sort of a byproduct of the research questions that we were asking, but, but it became an important part of the strategy. So <clears throat> these are communities that, where, that the girls come from, um, and, you know, we've kind of decided that, uh, girls living within a two kilometer walking distance is um, are people who can come and participate easily in the program. So that's one kind of engagement. Uh, going on to the second kind of engagement, uh, next slide, Miriam. Uh, we uh, recruited teachers and um, a young woman as a mentor from the community, and I'll talk about the mentor characteristics in a minute. Um, so, and we held most of the times we held the programs in a primary school that um, the girls were, uh, where the girls lived. Not necessarily the, where the girls attended school because a lot of these girls were attending secondary school beyond the immediate vicinity of the community. Um, so here, part of the community of reference communities becomes participants, um, in important influential people who live beyond the bounds of the community. So this man, for instance, um, is a person who is in part of the education infrastructure, um, and um, it's a teacher and a mentor explaining to uh, their superiors within their uh, infrastructure what um, the program was about. The program had a strong focus on technology-related skills to promote, to promote kind of a certain kind of um, access to the world beyond the village uh, through computers. Uh, next slide, please. We, of course, um, right from the beginning, had to get various permissions and had to get buy-in from the community, and we chose to do that by organizing a community-based support group. Um, which met periodically and um, was updated about what we were doing in the program. And it included occasionally um, addressing some of these bottlenecks um, that Miriam talked about uh, in terms of, you know, there was one instance where one group of girls weren't coming to the program because there was some impediment to their commute to the program and we decided to enlist the uh, the support group um, to address that issue. Uh, so these were, you'll see, sort of much more somber, um, serious-looking men for the most part, but also some um, female members in the community. In Bangladesh, there are um, not many, but uh, women engaged in family planning, in schools as teachers, as well as various NGOs through microcredit microfinance programs um, and health programs. And we tried 
as much as possible to keep that gender balance in the community engagement. Um, next slide, please. We also had built into the program um, these, again, sort of also somewhat somber community advocacy sessions where we dealt with specific issues of concern. Here in this one, you see that there are uh, religious leaders pre present and you know, probably focusing the discussion, I don't quite remember where this came from, but on some aspect of the marriage uh, registration process, which is one of the tools that um, the program, the national program uses um, quite um, frequently to address uh, norms about child marriage. Uh, so uh, these were all the various kind of engagements with men. I, I wanted to highlight the different types of engagements to, uh, to also uh, talk a little bit about different um, constituencies within the community and they all kind of serve slightly um, uh, different purposes and uh, it's, not, uh, it, it's not usually very um, useful to bring in very heterogeneous groups. So for instance, we had much more frequent meetings with parents groups, uh, mothers and fathers separately usually, uh, to address their levels of concern around uh, the concerns and or, but also to kind of enhance them as promoters. Uh, next slide please, and that's my last slide. So again, sort of I wanted to include this slide, which is a little, Miriam didn't like it because it's a little blurry, but um, it's <laughs> to highlight that uh, we're still keeping the focus on girls uh, and the girls as a collective and that's to, in my mind, another, an important part of the community engagement is to um, sort of highlight girls collectively as an important uh, part of the community um, that we hope that, hoped that this program would help to promote um, their presence and their positive presence. So I want to say a little bit um, in conclusion about what we're doing next. So in the follow-on to Balika, we are, um, the objective is very much to scale up and so we're partnering with government and in one of the partnering engagements, we are um, working with the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs uh, who, and to train them and to monitor, um, to help with the monitoring and supervision of the program. Um, uh, but in that scale up, we are actually testing, again through a randomized design, uh, two different approaches to community engagement. One in which for all these other components are there in various uh, forms, but the community engagement piece differentiate between engaging with men and women, and the idea is to see, ask which works uh, better. Uh, so basically, um, that's, um, we'll have some results on that uh, next year. And the last point I want to mention, and by way of introduction to the next uh, presentation, is that um, I feel an important element of the Balika community engagement strategy is to recruit a mentor from the community who, um, who knows the community well, who is acceptable to the community, uh, but more, most importantly, who, um, uh, who is an important role model for the girls. So that's another way in which, uh, and uh, we, most of us who worked closely with the program felt that that element was by far the most important piece of our community engagement strategy. Thank you, and on to Eva. Thank you, Sajida, for that introduction because it's definitely one of the most important things, I think, in the toolkit, which I'll be talking about today. Um, what is a mentor and what are they like? So I'll be talking about the second resource, which you can see is called Making the Most of Mentors, a Practical Toolkit for Adolescent Programming. Um, why did we develop this toolkit? There it is, you can see um, the cover now. So why did we develop this toolkit? There were two main goals. The first one was to share learnings that the Population Council has gathered over the last decades about working with mentors in girls programs. Um, 
And the second one was to create a repository of really useful nuts and bolts mentor-related materials that can be adapted by program planners who are working with mentors in girl programs around the world. So I've done a lot of trainings with groups that are working with girls, and they often are very excited about the concepts of what to do, and then, okay, now exactly what do we do, and how do we do it? So now I feel like this is a toolkit that can deliver part of that piece, giving people very basic step-by-step um, -step with how you engage with mentors. So all of the tools in the toolkit come from evaluated programs. Um, overall, they had mixed but generally positive effects, especially when it comes to empowering girls. And I also wanted to mention that while the tools that we've included in the, the toolkit are based on years of experience and evidence, the programs themselves haven't been evaluated to see what aspects of mentoring are most important. For example, is a six-day training better than a 10-day training? Um, however, I'm confident that the tools we've included here will be useful for anyone looking to start or refine a mentor-led program that works with young people. Why have a whole toolkit just focused on mentors? Mentors are the key to program success, so getting their selection, training, and support right is very important, as Sajida mentioned. Um, you can have a great curriculum and have done a very good job um, choosing the girls that will participate in the program, um, but the program will have its best results when the content is delivered by well-trained and engaged mentors. Mentors are also the main interface between program staff and girls, um, between the families and their communities. Being a mentor is also a, a complex and multifaceted role, and it fills a critical need that girls have for social support and positive role models. Creating a cadre of mentors also gives a role to promising young women in a community that may otherwise have a dearth of such roles. So mentors are really important, and uh, I think it's useful to have the tools to do a good job with them. So who is this toolkit for? Um, all of you who are listening in on the webinar are a key audience we're hoping to reach, uh, program planners, people who supervise mentors, and even the mentors themselves. Within the toolkit, each tool has a primary audience that um, is highlighted, but of course, anyone who finds any tool useful um, is welcome to use it. What was the process of developing this toolkit? So this toolkit reflects decades of experience uh, the Population Council has had across the world working with mentors. We worked to gather materials from programs the Council has run that use mentors in uh, mostly girl programs, so there was one or two that also worked with boys. Um, we read through the process evaluations for those programs that had them to pull out key lessons about mentors, um, had phone calls with program staff, emails, and follow-up discussions with our advisory group. So a big thank you to everyone who gave their time and inputs into this. Programs that contributed came from around the world, including Bangladesh, as Sajida just talked about, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Guatemala, who will be hearing from right after me, Kenya, Mexico, and Zambia. The programs worked with in and out of school girls, urban and rural girls, married girls, girls in domestic work, and others. And the programs are mostly targeting girls between the ages of 10 to 19. Okay, next slide, please. Um, now I'm going to go through um, the key contents of the toolkit. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, a key element of this toolkit is we're hoping that you'll take what we've gathered here and adapt it for your own context, for the program you're running, the population you're serving. Um, some of the tools could be used just right off the shelf, but everything is always better when it's um, customized to what you're doing. Um, so, for example, you could adapt it for programs that are working with girls and boys, um, adding contextual details or locally relevant examples. Um, one thing that we will be putting online soon to make adaptation easier is an online compendium of the tools that you can download and have that Word file or that Excel file so that you can add your own logos and put in the text that's relevant for your program. That's coming very soon. Uh, okay, so on to the contents of the toolkit. Uh, the first piece is on mentor profile, recruitment, and pay. So at the POP Council, being a mentor means being similar to but slightly more advanced than the girls who are your participants in the program. So what do I mean by that? 
mentors should be local, as Sajida highlighted, uh, just a little bit older than the girls and share a similar profile. So for example, refugee girls should have a refugee mentor. Married girls should have a mentor who is also married as a girl. Um, and that exact match is not always possible, but um, to the extent that you can have that, it, it usually works best. So the toolkit includes lists of characteristics that council programs have used to find mentors, some example advertisements, interview questions with score sheets, and guidance on mentor pay, and additional ways that mentors can be compensated. The next piece is on mentor training and retention. So training mentors um, is important not only in the content of a curriculum, but also in how they engage with girls and run participatory sessions. Um, this is something that's new to most of them. Many mentors will not have been involved in a program that taught them anything that way. So that is um, often very new information. So this section of the toolkit goes through not only agendas, and presentations for training mentors, but also lessons for teaching facilitation techniques and examples of how mentors can support and learn from each other as the program progresses. Also, um, information about how mentor supervisors can support mentors in their work. The next piece of the toolkit is on actually forming groups of girls and delivering content within the groups. So this is really the core of what mentors do. This section goes through how they can form and lead the groups and covers lessons on how they can set ground rules, talk about sensitive issues, some tips on working with parents and guardians, and it also includes general teaching tips and worksheets mentors can refer to as they plan their sessions. Then we move on to monitoring and evaluation, um, which doesn't have to be the scary thing that many people um, may think when they hear that. Covers a range of ways to monitor and evaluate mentors' work and to help them improve. So feedback um, about mentor performance can come from a lot of different audiences, fellow mentors, supervisors, and girl program participants. And there are examples of tools that have been used with each of these to give feedback on mentors. Uh, the section also includes worksheets that mentors can use to track what is happening in their sessions, for example, who came, what issues arose during the session, and guidance for how they would follow up on, for example, girls who are missing too many sessions or um, sensitive issues that are coming up. There's also a tool that helps measure how mentors themselves have changed as part of being a mentor in a program um, and how they've gained skills as part of the process. Um, we also have a number of case studies that go into more detail about how these different issues played out in some of the programs that contributed tools. Um, for example, adapting content for low literacy environments, models of sustainability from Ethiopia and Guatemala. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Angel to give us um, some more information about one of these case studies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you everyone for listening in. Um, I'm going to talk about the Abriendo Oportunidades program. If we can go to the next slide, please, to give you more context. So uh, the Abriendo Oportunidades program was designed specifically for indigenous girls in Guatemala who usually live in remote communities. Um, the norm is lack of access to services, in particular a challenging uh, transition to secondary education, most times because of uh, the lack of infrastructure. So among these uh, indigenous girls, this group of indigenous girls ages 8 to 18, we see a steep decline in school enrollment around puberty. And so the program was designed to be a community-based program uh, that organizes girls into age-appropriate groups, ages 8 to 12 and 13 to 18, um, where they come to weekly meetings that are led by a mentor from the community. The mentor uses uh, a curricular guide that was designed from the start of the program to try to uh, include all of the issues relevant to their lives um, and includes a community engagement approach, which I think is, has been key in how the program operates in the community. The, we use a community contract or a community agreement where we settle on the day, uh, the venue, uh, and the length of uh, the, the period of time that the program is going to be implemented. Uh, and we ask for support from community leaders, in particular for support 
to the mentor that leads the session. So the delivery approaches, um, we have a, a diversity of languages in Guatemala and girls from different communities speak different languages. So the mentors have uh, been trained and, 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 and they are always bilingual uh, so that they can speak to girls in, in the language, in their own language, in their native language, and also in Spanish, which is our official language. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. The program has, uh, since it was piloted in 2004, um, has been testing different modalities of implementation. Um, in particular, the program used to have a very, a very scattered uh, presence across uh, the country. So say three communities in one district, uh, five communities in another district. But we changed that approach uh, in order to have more impact. Um, and by that we mean uh, going into the places where we uh, saw hotspots for uh, challenging indicators for adolescent girls, like child marriage. Um, once in those hotspots, uh, we identified a district and then we reached as many girls as possible. So in the setting that I'm going to talk about, uh, we worked in 50 communities out of the 150 communities in a single district. So it made the program very relevant. And our priority was still to offer girls a safer transition through uh, adolescence. So next slide, please. So in this particular setting, uh, the challenge was uh, that we needed to recruit at least 50 mentors uh, to work with girls. Um, these mentors, uh, not were not necessarily trained as teachers before um, so in previous stages of the program before we expanded into this setting i was talking about um, we designed a peer led a peer-led cascade leadership approach where mentors from the pilot were trained to uh, to provide not only coaching and supervision um, but also uh, to be there for mentors as they were learning how to lead and facilitate session with girls. Um, so these mentors, that, that's where the initial notions of uh, coaching guides for mentors were developed. Um, these experienced group of mentors were also recruiting new mentors to the program. So having them in this new setting where we had to reach a lot of communities made a lot of uh, difference because they were there to, to talk about not only their experience, but they had a good eye in terms of what a good mentor would be in terms of uh, um, a leader that was able to speak to the community, to work with girls, and to be able to uh, conduct household visits, for example, which is one of our approaches into retaining girls in the program. Um, so another key uh, activity that these mentors have uh, been leading ever since the pilot of the program is the community mapping, or it's another tool that's referred uh, to in the toolkits to the girl roster. Um, it is basically an exercise to identify all eligible girls in the community. Um, not only it gives us a sense uh, to know how many girls will be in each group and for monitoring purposes, it also informs the basic indicators that we're dealing with in the community. Um, but it also allows mentors and these uh, monitoring mentors, as we call them, uh, to be visible in the community, to walk around in the community. And so they are the ones collecting this uh, information. Um, and, and, and so by the time the program starts, people are already familiar with them. So this purely cascade leadership approach made a difference into not only uh, the quality of mentoring, but also the performance of mentors. You can go to the next slide, please. So uh, very briefly, the key tasks assigned to mentors and the monitoring mentors that I was talk, uh, talking about. Uh, so they participated in the community mapping. Um, they organized meetings uh, with uh, parents, with community leaders, as uh, Sajida was saying before. This is a key element, having them lead um, the discussions with community leaders, with um, the materials that they need to do so. Um, then uh, the household visits to encourage girls to stay in the program, 
and using monitoring tools. Most of these mentors, because of the setting that they uh, work in, uh, were not necessarily used to registering uh, uh, data or were not used to using monitoring tools. So building capacity during the trainings that not only had to be uh, comprehensive, um, they had to be every quarter. Uh, we also were reinforcing their skills that could also build their professional development. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. Then for the monitoring mentors, uh, as I was saying, the mental recruitment tools, for example, that are, are now available, were pretty much informed in our case by these initial group of experienced mentors that served as uh, coaches, that served as tutors for other the new mentors. So each of them had assigned, we assigned the teams of uh, six mentors uh, that they usually visited, that they uh, could communicate with often, um, and that they could also uh, serve as a role model uh, for them. So um, they were not only talking about program issues, but also issues that were relevant to their lives. So the coaching guide uh, was key in providing these mentors with on-the-ground solutions, uh, which is, uh, uh, as I was saying, not all of them are teachers, and so having the chance to have feedback from another mentor uh, as the session was developing or after the session uh, was conducted um, made a difference into the quality of the program. And um, our team of uh, mentors led by our education specialists have really led the way into making these tools not only a better quality but also more easy to digest for everyone. And another key element reporting back to us um, um, on the basic information that we needed uh, so that we could work on incentives for girls, on, on better strategies to reach the girls that we were not reaching. All of these mentors receive a, a stipend that at the moment was comparable to, uh, half, to a half time in, in, for the community mentors, half time uh, of what a teacher would make and then a full time uh, stipend for what a teacher does. So if we go to the next slide. In sum, um, so I think what made a difference here uh, in, 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 in the program for Guatemala was the fact that we developed a support mechanism for mentors that ideally should be peer-led. Um, so the different iterations of the program that we now work in, the different, uh, as the program is also expanding, um, we have a better sense of what will work because we have this reference from these mentors that have worked in different settings uh, to inform our approaches. Um, we know that the training should be regular, comprehensive, and should not assume all mentors have uh, teaching skills. And there also the more experienced mentors made a difference into leading the way on how, on, on, on where were the limits in terms of how you could, how much content mentors could manage. Um, and then not only to provide trainings that were related to the curricular content that they delivered to girls, but also professional opportunity. This means uh, helping them find uh, strategies to pay for their tuition or to enroll back in school if they weren't, or to pursue a, a, a college degree. Um, and so that also led to us realizing that these mentors need a safe space themselves, a regular space where they can meet, usually a local office, you, know, you don't invest that much resources in that, but it's also something that we often miss. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, you know, the program has been working for over 14 years now uh, across different uh, uh, communities in Guatemala. It, it has reached over 15,000 girls. Uh, and we knew that uh, by building mentors' capacities and by giving them the opportunity to be connected, they would eventually be motivated to start their own organizations, what we call their own movements. And so um, once they showed interest, uh, we provided legal and financial uh, assistance to uh, allow them to create their own organizations. And so there are some groups of these mentors uh, around the country that are already organized 
to run programs in, in a capacity of implementing partners and not just a one-off uh, program intervention. Um, we think that's a path to sustainability, not only in terms of uh, reaching more girls, but also in terms of the commitment these mentors have uh, to the cause of adolescent girls in Guatemala. Wonderful. Th thank you so much, Angel. Um, so this is Eva again. I just wanted to wrap up by um, giving a little synthesis of what we've talked about today and talking about the links that these tools have with the PYD learning agenda. So today we've discussed um, two new tools and two very interesting case studies that I think will help implementers think through to under-discuss aspects of programming. Um, for groups for adolescent girls, group-based mentor-led programming. The first is to understand the role of communities in developing programs for girls, um, and that's a step-by-step -step guide. So this tool provides guidance about the characteristics of communities and girls within them that are key to understand when developing a program and how thinking through these issues can help increase a program's likelihood to succeed and have an impact. I think we have a few questions that are coming up about that that um, will allow us to go into a little more detail there. And the second tool, um, the Mentor Toolkit, discusses making the most of mentors, who are the ones who deliver the programs and are the face of the program for the community, the girls, the parents, and the guardians. And we just heard about um, an example from Guatemala, which to me is one of the just most impressive examples of seeing mentors evolve over time um, all the way to having their own self-sustaining organization. Um, so these tools together provide resources that guide program planners in um, taking into consideration the context in which a program works and also the nuts and bolts about how to find, train, and use the work of mentors to guide effective programs. Um, related to the PYD learning agenda, these tools contribute to helping understand how programs can achieve positive outcomes in low and middle income countries, um, which is theme one, by highlighting two sometimes overlooked aspects of programming, the community context and um, the mentors who will be delivering the program. The two tools also link to theme four, which is PYD for vulnerable or marginalized youth. For example, the Community Considerations tool discusses finding sometimes overlooked girls in communities, such as girls who are engaged as domestic workers or out-of-school girls. The Mentor Toolkit includes sections for mentors on working with girls with disabilities and dealing with difficult and sensitive issues, including tips on counseling girls who are experiencing um, difficulties and linking them to appropriate services. Um, and also making sure the mentors are linked to the appropriate services that they need. The mentor tool also touches on theme five, which is youth engagement in PYD program by focusing on preparing young people to be leaders in their communities and discussing how programs can use girls as the next generation of mentors. Um, so I wanted to also point you to the URLs here. Um, so this one, I think you'll all have this presentation later so you can see the link, but watch this page um, because we encourage you to visit the website today and read what we've got so far and then also to um, come back in a couple of weeks and download and use the tools that we'll have. Um, as I mentioned, the Mentor Toolkit, right now you can see the toolkit, but we're also going to make available editable versions of each tool so that you can download that and put your own logos in in a very easy way. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Justina for the Q&A. It looks like we have some interesting questions. I'm looking forward to talking about those. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great insightful presentation. Start question and answer. Perhaps I, well, uh, I was just going to start with one of the questions while the technology is being sorted out, uh, asking about the language of the new tools and if they're available in Spanish, and not yet would be the answer, but um, 
I, that is definitely something for which there's an appetite. That said, the tools from the program that Angel has described, Aprendo Oportunidades, were originally in Spanish, and we translated them to English. And um, we can certainly make those available online. Chasina? Hi. Yes, thank you for that. Um, so there's been a lot of questions about um, the stipends or incentives for the mentors. Um, the comment was that um, if mentors are women who are expected to volunteer, it often contributes to women's burden of doing unpaid labor in the community. Um, so what are some of the lessons um, that we can, that you can discuss about um, the mentor compensation um, as it relates to women's burden, um, as well as um, Oh, as well as sustainability of the compensation to the mentors. Um, I can share uh, my experience. This is Sajida. Um, so uh, talk a little bit about what we did with Palika. Um, our co definitely mentors have, have to be compensated. Um, and I think we constantly go through these discussions, but it's um, something that almost all pop council projects um, share that it's uh, not fair and not uh, not fair to them and not effective to not compensate. Um, so our rate of compensation was uh, like the uh, opportunidades rate. Uh, mentors were paid about half the stipend, uh, a stipend that was about half in amount to what primary school teachers earn. Uh, and that's um, in our case, I think the absolute value is not important. It was $100 uh, around, about uh, a month. Um, in terms of sustainability, we, uh, we had less um, success. Uh, so we had in our plan um, a community, part of the community engagement process was to begin a discussion about how the programs could continue and in what form after we left at the end of 18 months. So we mentors and teachers uh, followed a transition plan. And in about half of the communities that we worked in, uh, they were able to generate local community funds, essentially the purpose of which was to pay for the mentors, to run for about a year after we left the program, or, or at least un up until the time we were able to follow up. Uh, we. Um, we're not able to continue following further, uh, but I suspect that in that form, the communities, um, the programs didn't exist anymore. We heard from a couple of mentors that they wound up. But what we also heard, um, which I think is, uh, is specific to our program, because the mentors received a lot of training, because they were um, typically uh, enrolled in some form of distance learning programs, um, some mentors were picked up by government programs that had similar, that required similar skills. Um, and that, that's kind of informed our approach to engage with ex expanding government programs um, when we did the, when we designed the scale up. So that's from my side. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention, I I see there's and, um, one question. To mentors. Um, I see there's what one relationship do the coaches and the mentors, mentors have with the schools uh, that sorry. the girls went to? Um, and how can you answer that question? Tizina, could you repeat the question, please? Mm -hmm. What relationship do the coaches and the mentors have with the schools that the girls go to? And any any of us any of the presenters can answer. So Balika by design was so, located. Uh, in go ahead. Yeah, Sajina, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, Balika was designed to be located in a primary school, and so the mentor partnered with 
a teacher who worked part-time, the idea being both that this teacher would handle more complex material, but also that the teacher was kind of, um, there's a term in Bangla called murubi, kind of the, the elder in the, in the partnership. Um, and this kind of leads back to the other question about uh, uh, enabling mentors um, and supporting them so that um, they didn't, um, uh, you know, in case something were to happen to them that was difficult for them. So in the, um, for Guatemala, uh, it's a similar answer to what Sajid I just said. Uh, often the venue for the meetings is a school, um, or a particular classroom, and so um, mentors have to negotiate and start the conversation with um, the local school, uh, the local leaders. Uh, but also, uh, in the past four years, the, we have come closer to the Ministry of Education and in particular to a, a secondary alternative education program uh, that it allows girls uh, older than 14 to uh, continue their education. And so this um, department within the Ministry of Education found very interesting the role that mentors had. In, in the community um, and for those mentors that are already trained as teachers, um, they received additional training to uh, offer this program in the community. Um, so there are obvious links between the role that mentors play in the community and the role they can have uh, uh, in relationships with other ministries. Um how you support uh, mentors through the work in terms of Okay, so this question is, could you, could you share more about the process of supporting mentors through this work? Any I can try to answer that. So uh, one important element of how we ran the program was um, that we, um, similar to what Anhel talked about providing a safe space for mentors, um, we found it useful to have um, monthly meetings from, between mentors who lived in uh, commuting, commutable proximity to each other, so about 10 of them um, in groups, and they, that meeting was initially about doing mock sessions for forthcoming um, skills sessions, but it ended up being about much more than that, about highlighting better performance, supporting weaker performers in terms of running the sessions themselves, but it also kind of um, was the beginning of uh, some kind of a local area network support group. Um, Let's let Angel weigh in on this one. And Angel, also maybe to talk a little about the strategy you mentioned on your final slide with the uh, sustainability, the mentor-led organization. Right. So um, as for the ongoing training offered to mentors, um, as the program was expanding, um, the best strategy was to uh, have an education specialist join our team. Um, so she uh, um, not only designed the tools that mentors needed to use for continuous training, but also designed a continuous training program. And it was through a process of consultation with mentors that uh, were working with the program at that particular time. It also included girls, and so it assessed the content of the curricular guide, and it also helped us assess 
um, the that that trainings um, should be continuous. I mean, having this idea that it was not just one shot training on SRH, but that it actually had to be comprehensive, um, and so that mentors could have the expectation that even if um, uh, a week long training was coming every two months, for example, that they would also have the opportunity to meet with their coach or their monitoring mentor um, to discuss a particular issue during the week, during a weekend. Um, so it was all part of this continuous training program uh, designed for mentors in particular. And, and having an education specialist in our team um, made a difference to improve quality. Um, and then in terms of the a strategy to sustain the efforts to reach girls, I think um, th that's the discussion, how you sustain uh, mentors' interest, commitment uh, into working with more girls uh, as new content is being developed. Um, and so the answer for us was investing in their livelihoods, in their economic opportunities. So they already had the will to be organized um, they are already reaching girls, um, even in remote places. So um, we are now working uh, to equip them um, with uh, productive means, um, employment opportunities, as I was saying, and trying to build an infrastructure that supports them because the work they already they do with girls is already good. Um, so the strategy is now more focused on how you keep them engaged and what is needed uh, and it's usually opportunities to keep on going, uh, to continue their education, um, support as they prepare uh, the paperwork to go and look for jobs uh, and also uh, investment in the ideas that they have uh, to start their own businesses. Um, but it's different to talk about sustainability for one mentor or for three mentors as to talk about sustainability for a group of mentors that are already organized. Great, thanks very much. I... Thank you. Um, for the next question, what tools or strategies does Population Council use with mentors to support mental health of the mentors especially if they are discussing topics with their groups that may evoke their own trauma. Angel? Uh, part of the training that uh, they receive is not only training on career, career guide, uh, but it also contemplates uh, the different organizations that are already there. Um, so, for example, the Office of the Defense of Indigenous Women, um, the Human Rights Office, uh, or the Local Officer for Human Rights. Um, and so we can try to connect them to the mentors. And so they usually have a spot during trainings to um, discuss this with mentors. Um, and at some point uh, where... Uh, in, where mentors say that issues are too, uh, that are important for them to talk about. Um, we usually bring in uh, a specialist that can uh, discuss with them on a personal ground, uh, their well-being. You know, that's a different dimension from their role as mentors. And um, so Short answers, A, try to connect to the resources that are already available, and B, be mindful that when mentors need it, you might be able to bring in uh, additional work to work, additional support to work on their mental health. Great, thanks very much. And I'm gonna ask my colleague Judith Bruce, known to many of you who is joining us here in New York uh, on the mental health support question. It's a very timely question and actually working on it yesterday because I think there's a lot more work to do on trauma-informed programming. Um, and for example, I mean, things that have come up in many cases, how the resources are delivered to mentors is important. So I think mechanisms like mobile money and other things so that they interface. In many early programs, there was, you know, small NGOs 
resistant to giving them their funds, and that was stressful. So in one place, we went to mobile money so that they had a direct access. That's a sort of practical dimension. Um, work ratios that were sometimes different between one mentor and the other, so regularizing that, and then just straight on trauma. Um, there's been some work now done in South Sudan that we're eager to see uh, used in other places, which worked with mentors and could actually measure not only mental health changes in the mentors, but and often appears to be related to how much work they do with others, an idea, idea of healing yourself by healing others. And then some a physiological test, heart rate variation, which seems to show reduction. So I think it's, a, first of all, a needed frontier, a real frontier. Um, obviously, there's trauma all around the world, but there are a few places where it's especially intense. Uh, so a group we're working with called the Trauma Project, that is literally the question that they're, what trauma inform, how can we do better with trauma-informed programming? And a outstanding question is, um, in some settings, unless you deal right up front with trauma, other content really can't be received as well. So that's another question I know as we are moving to the refugee and other settings and displacement. So it's an excellent question, beginning to have some answers, and as I said, a little, in, little indicative something from work in South Sudan, which we hope we will extend to Kenya. Great, uh, thank you. So I am going to uh, pose a couple of questions that were asked in relation to the uh, presentations on the community considerations guide and the community engagement. First question is about how we define formal or informal communities. And uh, perhaps I could take the first whack at that and I invite any of my colleagues to join. So. Uh, we thought it was important to specify because, for example, not all peri-urban settings are informal. There are formal peri-urban areas that are on the outskirts of large cities and might be planned to some extent, might receive government services to some extent, and then there are others that just spring up. Uh, we here in the U.S. can look just uh, below the border in Mexico to see uh, informal um, communities that have sprung up and do not benefit from any types of um, public services. So um, we felt, again, in, <clears throat> in terms of access and opportunity and risk that those were important factors to consider. Um, does anybody want to add on that? Okay. So I will now go on to the next question, um, which was posed in relation to the community <clears throat> guide which is if the data is disaggregated by age, gender, and disability at the very least. So um, absolutely, we uh, advocate for uh, disaggregated data and as much disaggregation as is possible. Just to reiterate, the Community Considerations Guide doesn't provide answers, it provides questions. So really, the answer to that question is up to the user. Um, but we absolutely, at a minimum, I uh, would endorse and uh, recommend disaggregation by sex and also ideally by age where that's possible. I think um, some of the large sources of data that will be useful, for example, census data, um, is using existing data should always be a starting point, but it's going to be limited, and the degree of detail, particularly at a sub-sub-sub-sub-national level, um, is going to be limited. We um, have mentioned a couple of times a tool called the Girl Roster, which is a digital information collection tool um, that uh, has been used many times to fill in the gaps that large uh, surveys like the census or like demographic and health surveys or multi indicator cluster surveys leave out to understand the community going household to household to get a broad indication of the types of girls and young women or the types of boys um, that are living in that community and using that as a basis for program design. So the girl roster tool is also um, available on our website where you see the link on the slide there and you can learn more about that, um, though it doesn't specifically ask about disability, but it's often adapted um, by country and that consideration could be there. Any of my colleagues want to add on the disaggregation question? 
All right. So we have one question uh, from Judith in the room. So there are no other questions that have come in, though still we're monitoring the chat box. So, and we have a few more minutes. If you do have other questions, please feel free um, either now or after the webinar. But um, pending that, Judith, go ahead. Okay. On the disaggregation, I obviously I think you mentioned, but the support system, you know, the whether living, whether that particular girl or boy is living with two parents, one parent or no parent, I think this is really important because those are very dynamic and they're often taken for granted and there's often an underestimation or an overestimation of the amount of support that's available um, to the, the primary beneficiaries. And as more and more of those in need will be in displacement circumstances and all. I think keeping an eye on that piece of it, they may say nominally that there's, you know, a male head of household, but he's just not there at the time. So I think that's important information to factor in. Uh, and lots of programs, people asked about compensation, lots of programs imagine, quote, parent enga engagement, unquote, the availability of time and devotion. That's going to vary a lot also. Um, who actually can attend and does attend meetings. I was interested in what Saja had to say about, you know, the parents meeting coming in and what differences you found, but first of all, who was that, who among the parents were there and what differences are found among what fathers say and mothers say about the program. We, we didn't do it very formally, but I think um, uh, the mothers groups convene much more easily than fathers groups. We also felt that, uh, and this is kind of the new uh, version of Palika, we also felt that um, uh, in addition to fathers and mothers, parents, uh, there is a category of young adults, um, typically recently married men and women, who um, because Bangladesh is on this trajectory of very rapid educational change, <coughs> These young adults, among the adults, are the ones who might be the best supportive allies for the girls. So, um, and in trying to engage with them, we find that, at least in terms of participation, it's the women who are much more accessible and reachable. Um, and we're going to be able to evaluate that again in a minute. Um, should I answer the question about measuring empowerment? Um, yes, that was from so Chelsea. I'll just articulate the question so everybody knows, I, which was how did Balika measure changes in girls' agency or empowerment as a result of the skills building program? So we had um, a huge number of questions in our um, assessment, in our impact assessment on uh, various dimensions of measurement. Um, we're, uh, if you recall, we're trying to assess how these different types of skills, education, livelihood, life skills, um, affect, um, affect empowerment differently. Um, the short answer is that we didn't see much differentiation. We saw positive change in a whole host of measures. Um, it looks like there are some indicators related to acceptance of violence gender-based violence, for instance, which are differentiated and uh, the gender awareness arms has more of an impact. Um, so I think we're kind of exploring that more. I, my colleague Momo Makino is in the room and she's been looking at some of this data. Momo, you want to add anything? Uh, hi, this is Momo. Uh, I'm um, Sawariko here from uh, Japanese um, Institute of Developing Economies. I'm uh, um, interested in the 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 um, uh, skill training, different types of skill training on um, uh, labor force participation. One of the possible indicators of um, adolescent girls' empowerment, and I. Um, in a rough uh, empirical analysis, I found out that, and, um, that in a um, context where uh, the, um, the gender norms, um, like some kind of 
special social norms are really um, prevalent, like um, the social norms against women work um, against women working outside the home, and where and in the context where the and, um, patriarchal norms are really strong, the skill training uh, on uh, gender awareness, uh, the, um, focusing on uh, addressing girls' um, agency, seems to have a consistently um, stronger impact as compared with simply um, education, like cognitive skill training, or uh, some vocational training, which seems to be practical um, um, in the labor market. Great. Thanks very much. So we're just about at time. So with that, I am going to thank everybody, our presenters, uh, Sajida, Eva, and Angel, and um, our uh, questioners and participants, and our uh, satellite responders to questions. So we appreciate that very much. And um, thank you to PYD and uh, Youth Power Learning for facilitating and enabling this webinar. And I will leave it over to them to say the last word. The tools. Um, this is a valuable res research which can be um, practically applied in the field. So what can we do next? Um, please. Continue to contribute to the Twitter stream and spread the message of hashtag positive youth development. Um, there's always opportunities to join one of our four communities of practice. And please also visit the Youth Power Learning Hub at www.youthpower.org and use the resources, best practices, and knowledge shared. And we welcome organizations to send any materials that advance the evidence base on the learning agenda for positive youth development. And you can send that information to info at youthpower.org. So thank you for participating in the Youth Power Learning event and the recording of today's event and any resources and the tools will be shared with everyone that participated. Enjoy the rest of your day.